we're here to make a new type of news. New insights, new styles and new topics every day. We are News Generation. Making news just for you. It's March 30th here in Seoul. I'm Shin Yun, and this is News Generation, where we make the news at Arirang's very own open studio. Every morning, we'll discuss the top issues and latest current affairs affecting people in their 20s and 30s. Joining me in the studio is Cheska Dainhong. Happy Thursday, everyone. Happy Thursday, and Walter Lee. Lovely to be here. And both are here to speak on behalf of those in their 20s and 30s. Now, we're going to start with the news feed, which covers different hashtags and news items that have been trending on social media over the past 24 hours. And the first hashtag is Apple Gangnam. Apple will open its fifth store in Korea this Friday. It will be launched in the Gangnam-gu district of Seoul, greeting Apple users with their latest products and key services, such as the recently launched Apple Pay. And the second hashtag is Ripoff. We've seen cherry blossoms bloom early this year. Because of that, many Koreans have quickly changed reservations to iconic sites to see these spring flowers. As if this wasn't a big hassle, another issue that's been prevailing with stores or vendors near these sites ripping people off. How? By charging a lot of money for the region's so-called specialty. And one person posted on social media how he had to pay roughly $40 for a supposed Jinhe region BBQ barbecue specialty, but he said this was a big rip-off considering the tiny portions. And the last hashtag is Star Wars. Mark Hamill, the actor behind the character Luke Skywalker of Star Wars, has decided to be the voice behind Ukraine's air raid app. Hamill advises Ukrainians to take cover whenever Russia unleashes another aerial bombardment. Here's what he says when the air alert is over. Attention, the air alert is over. May the force be with you. May the force be with you, and Hamill said he decided to lend his voice to help as much as he can with the people suffering from the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war. Now, I'd like to hear what our panelists have to say about the second hashtag, ripoff. A lot of people could relate to the person who claimed he had been ripped off while going to see these beautiful cherry blossoms. And some said certain vendors would make up regional specialties that aren't even there just to rip them off. And mm. I'm wondering, Walter, have you ever experienced this? Well, I haven't. Ex well, of course, we've all experienced it when we go to these popular places. Mm -hmm. But it's not just food that people get ripped off on. It's also accommodation as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who went down to see BTS in October last year might have experienced the hotel prices skyrocketing almost mm -hmm. twice as much. Mm -hmm. And even for the people who pre-booked before the concert was even announced, was uh, were asked to either cancel their reservation or actually add more money Money onto their reservation. It's crazy Outrageous. when things yeah, get very popular. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why a lot of Koreans are even thinking of going to Japan to see cherry blossoms <laughs> because they're just so sick and tired of getting ripped off at these sites. But there's also that there's also that say, you know, we should understand these vendors because mm -hmm. it's these iconic sites and times of the year that you can attract these customers and really get your sales up, especially considering record inflation. We've seen prices of ingredients going up, meaning higher prices in general. Mm -hmm. So, Cheska, do you understand this side of the topic as well? I mean, this is always such a conundrum and you brought both points very clearly. As Walter says, I think we've all been victims in a way when we go to these popular vacation mm -hmm. sites or even Europe and we have these very specific vendors that have slightly higher prices uh -huh. than things that you can purchase a little bit outside of these sites, right? But again, as a consumer, I have one point of view, mm -hmm. but from the vendor's perspective with the record inflation, and also the rent prices that is Definitely, going up. Definitely, that's a good point. I sometimes think that people do have to raise prices to take advantage mm -hmm. of this influx of people that are coming in. So this is always a conundrum. It is a conundrum. It is a tricky issue. But that was our news feed for this Thursday. And let's move on to today's discussion topic. We're going to dive into whether South Korea really is a drug-free country. Take a look at the screen to find out the answer. South Korea no longer seems to be a drug-free country. Recently, local media showed actor Yoo Ah-in being questioned by police for drug use. The actor allegedly purchased propofol, a sleep-inducing drug for non-medical purposes beginning in 2021. He also tested positive for marijuana, cocaine and ketamine, which are all completely illegal in Korea. But a bigger drug problem surfacing in Korea is illicit use among teens. Teens are finding ways to purchase prescription medicine without a doctor's note. The most popular product they're looking for is diatomin, also known as butterfly pills because of the way they look. Normally, it's prescribed for people on a diet as an appetite suppressant. 
but it requires a doctor's note because it's a psychotropic, meaning when it's abused, it can cause addiction and hallucinations. And it's easier for teens to purchase them online, which also makes it hard for regulators to catch buyers. Today, NewsGen aims to answer three questions. 1. How severe is the teen drug problem here in Korea? 2. How are young people getting their hands on these drugs in a supposedly drug-free country? 3. How are other countries dealing with drug problems among the younger generation? So today we're going to be talking about a relatively grim subject, drug abuse among teens in Korea. So Cheska, why don't you start us off by explaining how severe of an issue this is? Mm -hmm. And this is a truly grim subject, mm -hmm. but I do feel that we need to face the reality of the situation. So South Korea is no longer safe from drugs. And for every 100,000 people, if the arrested drug offenders exceed 20, now that's what's considered a red flag and sort of out of control in mm -hmm. the system. At the moment, currently in South Korea, we have 25 to 35 drug mm. offenders. So we've already passed we did. the limit. Mm -hmm. And the most concerning part is that on average, 35% of the total arrests mm -hmm. were in their teens and under 20. And if we take a look at the screen, we can see those figures more in detail. And if you look at the red bar, it mm -hmm. represents arrested drug users under 30. So this is not including those in the 30s. Mm -hmm. Now that alone comprised more than 40% in 2018. But take a look at the numbers. In just three years, the number of drug offenders almost doubled. And so did the percentage of people. And this is a very clear and dangerous sign of how fast drug abuse among the younger generation is spreading. Mm -hmm. And really, this is, this is a sort of emergency call for an immediate action, I feel. And it's quite alarming because, as you said, drugs are illegal in Korea. We're supposedly a drug-free country. Supposedly, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. but how are a disturbingly growing number of young people getting their hands into illicit drug usage here in Korea? You know, that is such a great question because some journalists did a social experiment mm -hmm. to see how much drugs they can actually get, something as dangerous as mm -hmm. fentanyl in a day. So he went around and you know, submitted not only his ID, but other people's ID. And he was able to get multiple prescriptions from hospitals that did not even check. So this is just a clear indication of how serious the problem is. Definitely. And for young teens, because they can so easily get their hands through a prescription, they don't realize the, the gravity or the destructive aspect of the drugs. So the lack of regulation in these prescriptions have actually further exacerbated the situation, I feel. And as you mentioned, fentanyl is a prescribed drug. It's mm -hmm. usually a painkiller, but it's 100 times more potent than morphine, which means you definitely need a doctor's note. But Absolutely. people are illicitly using it, mm -hmm. right? And Walter, then uh, once again, I would like to ask you this question as well. Mm -hmm. How are so many young people getting their hands on this? Well, it's not just people who are not checking the IDs properly. Mm -hmm. It's also the possibly dodgy doctors that are out there that are taking money under the table and also just keep prescribing people who not basically might not even need the drug but right. are also abusing the drug as well. So this is the case with other prescribed drugs such as ketamine and propofol exactly. drugs that are also have this anesthetic effect. Right. Obviously the most recent news and as we mentioned before is coming out is the Yuan case, mm -hmm. right? This is obviously making huge headlines around Korea. It is good to see that we are trying to work on stopping it but there's obviously got to be a lot more done. People are also, you know, there are many different ways you can get it. One of the, I guess, wouldn't say easy ways but very dangerous ways is the dark web the dark web yep so people are going through the dark web it these days it is a little easier to get on there at mm -hmm. least but yeah it's it's a way that people are going to get their drugs these days but i'm wondering it's it might be a quick and easy decision mm. but it's a long life-lasting consequence that you have to you know bring on to your whole life right but why are people doing this? Why are we seeing a growing number of people using drugs here in Korea? Mm -hmm. And I just want to highlight on mm -hmm. the younger generation mm -hmm. part as well. And as you mentioned, Yeon, it's so easy to get in, mm -hmm. but almost impossible to get out because there's the addictive part, right. right? And they make such easy deals, as Walter mentioned, through the dark web, but also through social media. Mm -hmm. And they even use cryptocurrency that leaves no traces. So they make deals through, you know, on the web and use special lingo. So we could be having a conversation right here, mm -hmm. and then I could be talking about a drug using lingos like, hey, do you want a candy? Do you want like a chocolate bar? Mm -hmm. And then nobody would notice. Right. And then they also, just within a day, you can place an order, purchase it, 
and then receive it. Mm -hmm. So it is extremely scary how fast things are moving at the moment. And according to an expert report, the more problem aspect is the younger generation don't know the gravity of the situation, so they have little to no guilt. And they usually do it as a group entertainment or through peer pressure by you know, doing it with children in the park or even right. in schools. Mm -hmm. So they feel this kind of herd sentiment that we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And they use it as an out, you know, a release of stress or just to escape the situation or the reality of what they're facing at the moment. Right. And apart from like a lot of outlets and social media making it easier for them to, you know, access these types of drugs, mm -hmm. what are other reasons that teens are, you know, getting their hands dirty with this? Well, to be honest with you, it could be just, let's just call it life, mm -hmm. basically. The pressures and the stress that people go through, they need to find outlets to, uh, to I guess, release that stress. Right. Obviously, alcohol is a big thing amongst teens as well. You've seen many underage drinkers as well, but Absolutely. now it's becoming more prevalent these days with drugs. Mm -hmm. um, the, let's say we know that the education system here is quite tough for the students. They Definitely. have a lot of exams to go mm -hmm. through. The pressure to do well is always there. So some teens are looking at ADHD medicine right. to just concentrate. Mm -hmm. But then what happens is they get hooked and they start to abuse it. So this is obviously something that we need, need to address. And that's why I would like to see if this situation is also prevalent abroad as well. But I know that some countries like the United States have partly legalized certain drugs like marijuana, right? Yeah, that's correct. So at the moment, there are 38 states for legal medicinal marijuana and 21 states for recreational use in the U.S. Now, it goes all the way back for, to California in 1996 when they made it legal for medicinal pur purposes mm -hmm. only. And now it still seems to be changing as far as last year, three states, Rhode Island, uh, Maryland and Missouri, made it uh, legal for recreational use. So there is a lot of change happening in the US. So maybe selectively legalizing a few drugs will help with the teen drug abuse problem or drug misusage in general. But to find out more, why don't we include a professor and medical director of addiction medicine from the United States? We're now going to include a professor and medical director of medicine addiction in our talks. It's Dr. Anna Lemke, author of the book Dopamine Nation. Dr. Lemke advocates better teaching programs on addiction and safe prescribing. She also educates policymakers and the public about the reason and solutions behind drug addiction. So it's great to have you with us, Dr. Lemke. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. All right, Dr. Lemke, so as you might have heard from our discussion today, more teens in Korea are getting their hands on prescribed drugs without a doctor's note, and some are even getting hold of narcotics. So I would first like to ask how the situation is like in the United States. We have a devastating situation of drug addiction and drug overdose here in the, in the United States. It's been going on for at least the past 20 years, as we've been seeing uh, a quadrupling of the number of people addicted to prescription medications, particularly opioids, but also benzodiazepines like Xanax and other psychotropics like anxiolytics and antidepressants. Um, and along with that quadrupling in the number of people addicted to prescription painkillers and anxiolytics, we've also seen rising rates of individuals um, dying from drug overdose. This past year, we had 107,000 Americans um, who had to have died from drug overdose, with the majority being between the ages of 25 and 35. So it's a huge problem. It's definitely a grave situation. And Cheska, you mentioned that a lot of teens and youngsters aren't aware of the gravity, right? Mm -hmm. And because they aren't aware of the gravity of the situation, they get in, but it's too late for them to get out because they're already hooked on these drugs. And that's why I would like to ask you, Dr. Lemke, could you explain to us what exactly are the dangers of misusing drugs from a young age, especially could you tell them to teens? Well, the dangers are the uh, you know, the changes that happen in the brain with exposure to addictive substances. Um, and these brain changes lead to a lot of problems for people, including that they need more and more of the drug over time to get the same effect, 
when they try to stop using, they go into um, such painful withdrawal that they're not able to stop using even when they want to. Then they marshal all of their resources to getting the drug, using the drug, hiding their drug use. Um, and before you know it, it's, it takes over their whole life. We talk about this concept of the hijacked brain. But even separate from the process of addiction, um, you know, one-time use can lead to death. We have a very serious situation here in the United States where so many young people associate a pill as being safe uh, without realizing that um, some of those pills are actually counterfeit pills that have fentanyl, for example, a, a highly potent opioid, which you mentioned is 100 times more potent than morphine. And so even with a single exposure to one pill, um, we have teenagers who are who are dying. You know, they go to a party, someone says, oh, try this. They don't even know what they're taking. And, um, you know, they, they die from a single exposure. So it's the risks of addiction, which are cumulative and usually take some time to develop. And then there are the very serious risks, including death of even just a single exposure, because people don't actually know what they're ingesting. Right, and I think it all comes down to regulation. And we mentioned it before we started our Skype interview with Walter that the United States seems to have partly legalized marijuana in certain states. And we're wondering, is that one way that we can control and better regulate drugs from getting in the wrong hand, uh, getting in the right hands? What do you think is the most effective way to stop teens or people who shouldn't be on drugs from getting drugs? Well, you don't want to conflate regulation with legalization. Mm. So invariably, every time we legalize a drug, more people use the drug. And there are more public health harms associated with the drug. We see that with cannabis. We, we see that with every prescription medication, whether it's opioids or benzodiazepines. Um, so I don't think legalization is necessarily uh, the answer. And in many instances, it's the wrong thing to do. But what we do need is more oversight and regulation of prescribing of potentially addictive and lethal drugs. In this country, our opioid epidemic, we have in part um, tackled that by creating much stricter regulations and oversight, not just of prescribing doctors, but also of the pharmacies that dispense the medications, of the manufacturers that make and promote the medications, uh, the distributors that get the medications from the uh, manufacturer to the pharmacies, um, the kinds of drug promotion, uh, things like trying to regulate the dark web um, and other illegal internet pharmacies. So you've got to have regulation. You've also got to combine that with education. Um, people need to understand the true risks of these drugs. There are definitely medical indications when, uh, you know, psychotropics, opioids, benzodiazepines, stimulants are very useful, but it's a very narrow situation. And when we go beyond that narrow situation, we do more harm than good. And then finally, you also have to recognize that there's going to be a subset of the population that's going to get addicted, and those individuals need access to treatment. So at the same time that you're working on regulation and oversight, we also, it's important to build up a treatment infrastructure. For example, that that young actor who's talking about propofol. Propofol mm -hmm. is a very serious and potentially lethal sedative. Definitely. I mean, the gap between the, the lethal deadly dose and the dose that people take for effect is very, very small. Mm -hmm. Someone who's using propofol is pro probably very deep into an addiction because it's so, so dangerous. So instead of stigmatizing that individual, what we need is to make sure that there's treatment uh, for that person so that they can get into recovery because recovery is real recovery happens mm -hmm. um, you know it's not just a one-way street you know addiction is a difficult disease but um, but people do recover and they have very meaningful um, happy thriving lives uh, in recovery from addiction Definitely. So it's better that we help them rehabilitate, we help them come back to society rather than stigmatizing them. Yes, exactly. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Lemke. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Now, here in the studio, any points that Dr. Lemke made that really fascinated you, Walter? 
Well, she actually pointed out the one pill that can, you know, contain anything within it mm -hmm. and therefore can damage somebody. I have heard many cases when I was living in Australia about people who go to festivals, they sell mm -hmm. these drugs during the festivals. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, yes, death is the terrible thing, but also there's been brain damage cases yes. as well, where it just affects everybody within the area and the families. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's not even worth once. And I loved how she said the legalization is relatively, it, it is needed, mm -hmm. but more importantly, it's about regulation and education. What do you think about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I agree on that point. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that stigmatization, stigma mm -hmm. needs to disappear in order for us to move forward. And also the fact about hijacked brain, because this is a chemical, mm -hmm. and there isn't actually data from Korea's uh, prosecutor office, mm -hmm. that the repeated offense for these crimes are twice higher so 35 to 40 percent, so mm -hmm. twice higher than the average of any other crimes, which right. means there's an addiction part is so strong. And that's why rehabilitation is so important. Mm -hmm. But why don't we now include our viewers in our discussion and let's find out what type of regulations or restrictions their countries have against legal drugs. So if you take a look at the screen, Tiris Bell says, there's a pretty big opioid and fentanyl crisis going on right now in the part of the U.S. I live in. Sentences for possession of these are very strict, often resulting in multiple years in prison. Leon Teo said in Singapore, the penalties on doing illegal drugs is really strict, with the most severe sentence being death penalty. D.D. Winfrey says it's a shame that people do discriminate against any use of narcotics. Portugal has decriminalized drugs now so that the gl glamour is gone, and drug abuse has definitely decreased. Now, I would think, I think this is a good segue into our final part of our discussion. So why don't we dig a bit deeper into the drug problems, drug regulations and penalties might be effective in the short run as mm -hmm. we've been talking about. But I think the thing with drugs is that people who are hooked on them recurrently end up in jail or have to go to rehabilitation because as we mentioned, it's quite addictive. Mm -hmm. So here in the studio, apart from criminalizing drug abuse, what do you think needs to be done to help people? Starting with Walter. Okay, so to me, it all starts with education from a very early age. Schools should be the ones to teach the dangers that mm -hmm. some drugs can have on one's life, but not just on one's life, the people around them as well. I mean, if you loved your family, it'd be a, you, you don't want to put them underneath this pressure mm -hmm. with you. Well-funded, well-run government programs need to be implemented, though we might not have a bigger problem compared to, let's say, some other countries. We really want to nip this in the bud before it gets too serious. Mm -hmm. Now, truthfully speaking, South Korea's biggest legal drug is alcohol at the yes. moment, and we see from time to time again how people's lives can be ruined just from alcohol abuse. So if we don't do something about this drug problem that seems to be slowly creeping in, I'm really scared for the South Korean public. Mm -hmm. mm. And Cheska? I love Walter's comment, and I completely agree mm -hmm. with him on the need for education. Another thing that I would like to add on is the stigma part. Mm -hmm. So we really need to raise awareness, and as the doctor said, rehabilitation is possible. Mm -hmm. So in order to get rid of stigma, we need to raise our voices and say rehabilitation is necessary and people actually can get better. All right, and hopefully our discussion could pave the way for South Korea to regain its title as a drug-free nation. And we'll be here every day from 9.30 a.m. to 10 a.m. Korea time, bringing you topics that young people are talking about. Special thanks to Cheska Dine Hall. Pleasure's mine. Thank you. And Walter Lee. Always lovely to be here. And thank you, everyone, for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. We are News Generation. Generation.